Hello, this is Mark Locke, Wheat Scientist with OSU Extension, speaking on behalf of the wheat science groups at the Ohio State University and Purdue University and the United Soybean Board, Indiana Soybean Alliance, and Ohio Soybean Council. You have received this brief video to alert you about Palmer amaranth, the new wheat thread in the Midwest that is starting to infest fields in Indiana and Ohio. Over the next few minutes, we will provide information about the characteristics of Palmer amaranth and the problems it has caused in crop production in the southern United States how it is spreading into Ohio and Indiana, and the steps you need to take now to prevent additional new infestations of Palmer amaranth and minimize its potential impact on the profitability of your farm or your clientele. The video also contains segments of interviews with two wheat scientists who have experience with Palmer amaranth, Bill Johnson, Extension Wheat Scientist at Purdue University, and Larry Steckel, Extension Wheat Scientist at the University of Tennessee. Palmer amaranth is a member of the amaranthus or pigweed family, which also includes red root pigweed and water hemp. Palmer amaranth has several characteristics that can make it considerably more problematic to manage than the other pigweeds. It is a prolific seed producer and female plants commonly produce up to 500,000 seeds per plant and occasionally over a million seeds. The small seed size allows it to be well adapted for minimum and no tillage systems that are common in Ohio and Indiana. Seeds have a wide window of germination from spring into late summer which means that effective management requires multiple applications of residual and post-emergent herbicides. The combination of these factors, along with a relative lack of seed dormancy, means that populations of Palmer amaranth can increase more rapidly from year to year compared with most other weeds. A few plants or patches of Palmer in one season can result in an extremely high population and challenging control situation the following season as seen in these examples. We are assuming that most Palmer populations are resistant to glyphosate and ALS inhibitors such as Classic and Pursuit, and growers who try to manage it primarily with glyphosate will cause it to become glyphosate resistant if not already. The outcrossing that occurs between male and female plants also helps the spread of herbicide resistance. Problems with Palmer amaranth management are compounded by its rapid growth rate which results in a narrow window of post-emergence application. This sequence of photos shows the growth of Palmer amaranth from the seedling stage on May 20th through July 22nd, ultimately resulting in a large plant with a lot of seed that greatly reduces yield and hinders harvest. Palmer amaranth is not readily controlled by post-emergence herbicides unless very small, less than a few inches tall, and so when delayed post-emergence applications are not completely effective, it can quickly regrow to a size where control is not possible. Palmer amaranth spread rapidly throughout the southern United States starting in 2005 and has resulted in a substantial increase in the cost and complexity of herbicide programs, the mid-season destruction of soybean and cotton fields where control measures failed, and the loss of profitability and in some cases bankruptcy of growers. The combination of glyphosate resistance and the rapid increase in infestations meant that many growers were caught unaware of Palmer's ability to survive herbicide programs that were not comprehensive and not managed closely enough. Herbicide costs for Tennessee soybean growers have increased from an average of $30 to $75 or more per acre, with similar increases in corn. For the growers that have Palmer amaranth and soybean, the cost of control has, has at least doubled, and in some cases probably tripled, where they're into year two or year three of a, of a heavy infestation. Growers experiencing high populations in a field for the first time have incurred substantial costs and still not obtained adequate control. This resulted in the destruction of many soybean and cotton crops in the south over the past few years in order to replant and try again or prevent these infestations from going to seed or because the yield loss was so substantial that there was no point in harvesting the crop. Some growers eventually resorted to hiring crews of laborers to remove plants from fields at a cost of more than $100 per acre. Plants must be completely uprooted and removed from the field because it's possible for them to reroot and continue growing if left in the field. Palmer amaranth has now been found in most Midwestern states, and there are substantial areas infested in Indiana and Michigan. Palmer now occurs in at least 20 counties in Indiana as of August 2013, with a concentration in northwestern Indiana. There are several known infestations of Palmer amaranth in Ohio at this time, which means that there are probably others we are not aware of. New infestations of Palmer appear to have several potential origins. The source of some infestations, including a major one in southern Ohio, may have been through contamination of seed used to establish crep or wildlife type areas. The source of the major infestations in Indiana and Michigan appears to have been the use of cotton processing byproducts for feed and animal operations, which were contaminated with Palmer seed. 
Manure from these operations was spread on crop fields, resulting in some initially limited infestations that then spread over larger areas, possibly via harvesting equipment. We do not know at this time really how frequently Palmer is a contaminant of the cottonseed feed products, but we have to assume that there is some level of contamination. It's also possible that equipment moved from the southern to midwestern United States has contained Palmer amaranth seed. Areas where we've identified Palmer amaranth, there's a high degree of correlation with, uh, with dairy industries being close by or uh, large farming operations where animal manure was spread and a combine went through that area and spread the, the seed to another field. Palmer amaranth is easily identified when large with seed heads, but somewhat more difficult to identify when small. Key characteristics for identification include a lack of hair on stems and leaves, the frequent occurrence of a single hair in a notch at the tip of younger leaves, long leaf petioles, the part connecting the leaf to the stem, especially on long, younger leaves. These are frequently as long or longer than the leaf itself. Leaves that are somewhat diamond or ovate shaped and widest near the base and organized in a rosette pattern growing point. The petiole length has really become a major identifying characteristic when trying to separate this species from water hemp. The hair in the leaf tip notch is very small and best seen on younger leaves. Leaf shape is another characteristic that differentiates palmer from water hemp. Leaves of water hemp are longer and more narrow compared with palmer, although at times there appears to be some hybridization between species and intermediate leaf shapes that make identification more difficult. Palmer amaranth will typically become larger than other pigweed species with a broad stem near the base that can be several inches in diameter. Ultimate size of the plant is of course determined by how early it emerges and whether it has to compete with the crop, but it can reach a size that exceeds most other weeds in midwestern soybean production. The long seed heads that are rough to the touch are another key characteristic for identification. There can be multiple seed heads per plant, which contributes to the prolific seed production. One of the reasons that you are receiving this video now is that we want growers to be aware of palmer amaranth as they harvest soybean fields this fall. It's absolutely imperative that where you suspect you have palmer amaranth infestations, contact your local agronomist and the weed scientists at Purdue and OSU to confirm the identification and obtain recommendations for management. It's possible to determine whether palmer plants are producing mature seed by shaking seed heads into your hand and watching for small black seeds that indicate maturity. Plants that are not yet producing seed should be uprooted and removed from the field. In fields where the plants have already produced mature seed, growers have one opportunity to try to prevent future problems by following these steps. Do not uproot and drag plants through the field since this will spread seed. Harvest infested fields last and thoroughly clean the combine afterwards. And finally, Mold board plow the field to bury seed and allow them to decompose and lose viability. This seems like a drastic recommendation, but our counterparts in the South have assured us that this is the last possible measure that can be used to prevent what they have experienced there. Try and keep it from, from getting started on your fields. And a lot of it is just as simple as going out, and if you see that one or two escaped plants that obviously were sprayed, go yank them up. Now, it can be easier said than done. Here we are in late July, and you've got drilled beans, and it's a good 200 yards off the field. Uh, but gosh, in the long run, it could, it could benefit you greatly. For people that have escaped plants and are not able to go out there and hand weed, there are a couple things that those growers ought to think about. First of all, I would harvest the infested fields last, if at all possible. Um, I would pull the combine to the, to the edge of the field and take an air compressor and blow it out, try to prevent spreading that, that seed to other fields. Um, I would uh, mold more plow those fields in order to bury the seed. The vertical tillage tools are probably not going to do it. They're just going to lift and drop the soil. We need to bury that seed. We need to bury it deep enough where it won't come up the next year. Other actions you can take to prevent infestations of palmer amaranth include more thorough scouting of crop fields within several weeks after planting next spring, controlling palmer in fence rows, roadsides, and similar areas, and ensuring that seed used for crep or other se seedings is free of palmer seed. It's also important to scout these new seedings to determine if palmer amaranth is present. Finally, there is the whole issue of cottonseed products used for feed. Users of these products should check with their supplier for assurances that they are taking steps to prevent contamination with palmer. Also, be sure to place additional emphasis on scouting the fields where manure is spread from animal operations using cottonseed products.
They're trying to manage it with 60, 70, 80, 100 dollars worth of herbicide and still not getting good control. Uh, we are not that far away if we, we lose one more mode of action really uh, effective on, on Palmer pigweed that it, you begin to question if soybeans growing them is viable uh, here in Tennessee. And from where I've driven across just Illinois, I was in Illinois last week, they look just as bad as a lot of our fields. So apparently it's up there as well. So this is getting to be a widespread problem that is a real threat to, to soybean production, not just in the Mid-South, but I think just in the Midwest and the U.S. in general. In addition to this video and the enclosed Palmer Amaranth fact sheet from Purdue University, we have online and print resources available for more information. The Weed Control Guide for Ohio and Indiana will be updated for 2014 to contain information on Palmer Amaranth. Also, the OSU Weed Science and the Purdue Weed Science websites have fact sheets, short videos, on identification of Palmer amaranth and management, and you can also get information at the Glyphosate Weeds and Crops Group website on glyphosate-resistant weeds like Palmer amaranth.